Must be that time. How y'all doing this evening? Y'all gonna show up on a Wednesday evening when you know the pastor's not in town? That must be y'all are good folks. I, I appreciate y'all being here. We do want to remember our, our mission team. I think they, when are they coming back? Friday or Saturday? Friday. So they're, they're, they're on the downhill slide now. <clears throat> I thought that's what it was. We, uh, Brother Keith there, Charlie Caraway's there, Dana and Paige Pittman. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Kayla Lee and Rachel Siegel McLaughlin and Nika. Nika, I think, are the ones that are there. So y'all keep them in your prayers. I, I uh, look forward to hearing what they got to let us know about. We also need to remember Lila Castle as she gets ready to go to Madrid, Spain for a, a teaching engagement, teaching slash missionary engagement that she told us about last week. Um, Lord's working in this church. We're growing. We're seeing new folks pretty regular. It is a, an awesome thing to be in a, an active church. We got a prayer chain message that came out yesterday for Alani Gorman. Gorham, Alani Gorham, three-year-old, second three-year-old I'm aware of here in just a couple of weeks, um, found unresponsive in a pool, and they, she didn't make it. The other one was uh, a friend of mine. Uh, grandparents were in my Sunday school class in Tallahassee. Um, Mike and Laura Sines was their name. Shelly and C.J. Dancer had a little boy named David. And David was also, they went to a Bible study, a Friday night Bible study. And the child was found in a pool. Um, I ran into to Shelley and, and CJ last Thursday night. They need our prayers. They are trusting the Lord. I pray that that's where the Gorham family is. I don't know them. Sarah, you you. They need our prayers. Um, their marriages need our prayers. It's not unusual for marriages to have problems when you have children lost like that. So the Lord needs to be foremost in their mind as they go through this. Um, we've got a, a long list. It's a shorter list than it used to be, but it's still a long list of folks. Um, Josh McDonald, that's Cynthia Klein's son, has been released from jail and went right back into a drug addiction lifestyle. So we need to be praying for Josh's salvation. He won't be able to break this if he doesn't find the Lord. And uh, we, need, we need for him to, to be able to straighten out. Charlie Reedy is a, a name that Susan Ashburn, I believe it was, <coughs> Ashburn, I went to school with her, that's what her name used to be. Susan Dees is her name now. Um, Susan knows a Charlie Reedy female that has checked herself into a rehab program, a Christian-based rehab program. If I recall, it's up in Birmingham. So we need to, to remember them. I know a lot of these folks have been on our list for a while. Um, Michael Chernak has got some procedures coming up at, at Mayo, and I think that's Monday week. Uh, that means a week from Monday. Uh, Sarah Johnson, if I understood that correctly last week, she has been admitted to the hospital in Jacksonville where she will be until she has this baby. She was seven and a half months pregnant and had a uh, a stroke, maybe, is what I heard. I, I don't know. Somebody may know more about it than I do. Um, Julie Evans is recovering from her knee replacement surgery, and Keith Collier at the bottom of the list is, is listed with colon cancer. That must be new because it's at the bottom of the list. One of my best friends in life is... Uh, is Gary Gray and his wife Miriam is listed on here. Miriam has been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. They were at Moffitt today, and I don't know what the prognosis is. 
they were trying to get her in a clinical trial. I texted Gary a little while ago and he said he's driving, he'll have to get back to me when he gets home. But um, the fact that they're coming home, yeah, I don't know whether that's good or bad. Um, they know the Lord's in control of the situation. She's been dealing with it for a number of years. She's been very private with it, but they're coveting prayers at this point too. Gary and Miriam were, again, at, at Parkway in Tallahassee with us, and um, we went on a mission trip together and extended it a week, couple of weeks, and, and saw the West, saw the Rocky Mountains and the Yellowstone and all those parts out there. And then we went to uh, Canada together. We had a, a great traveling partners. Nails passed her surgery, I guess. Every, she seemed she was here Sunday and, and, and was looking good. Um, Rita Sparkman is still recovering from her knee replacement. It's been a couple of weeks. I, ha I hadn't talked to Rita in about a week or so, but she sounded like she was doing real well with it. There's a lady that's been on our Sunday school class prayer list. Her name is Mika, M-I-C-A-H, Mika, but she pronounces it Mika. It's Letty Harvey's hairdresser, and she had double mastectomies uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, pray that they, she, she did that after a, a, a lengthy chemo process or radiation, one or the other, to, to try to reduce the, the, the cancer, breast cancer that she had. Letty asks every week for us to keep praying for her, so she's getting over it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know her good deal. Polly Nichols is one that's on our list. She's had some cancer surgery that she was trying to get strengthened back up so she could do some, some additional treatment. I'd need to talk to Larry about whether she has been able to do that or not, but uh, bottom line is she needs to continue to st be strengthened. Miss Virginia Strickland is, is Marty's mother, and she's evidently recovering well from her loose screw. They put a screw in her leg to keep her leg together, and it backed itself out. So she had a, Nicole was telling us her, her mother-in-law had a screw loose, so I thought that was pretty cool. She could do that without being derogatory in any way, shape, or form. Um, any, any other that we need to add to the list tonight? TJ? Yeah. That is a good phrase. <coughs> Fanny. I should have mentioned little Colby, little Colby Temis. Colby went to Shan's last week. He's the little three-year-old we've been praying for with the brain stem tumor. Um, they scanned him Thursday. He'll get results tomorrow, supposedly. So y'all keep... Colby and Josh and Ashley and Charlie in your prayers. Yes, ma'am.
let everybody hear that. Kelly Smith has been diagnosed with EDS and she's got some major life changes to, to deal with. Anybody else? We're going to need to get y'all. Yes, sir. She passed. Yes. Um, we heard that Sunday that she had passed away. She had, they had had hospice called in about a week on her. know that I heard about her from the Hardy's breakfast bunch that's where I heard about it anybody else yes sir We're going to need to get y'all some caffeine. I'm afraid y'all going to go to sleep on me here in a few minutes. That's okay. I, I've, I've talked to snoring folks before, so it'll be all right. Anybody else? Y'all must want to get out here. Mike, you've got my timer off up there, so I don't have a clue what time it is. So. They would appreciate it if you turn it back on. Anybody else? <coughs> y'all, there it is. Y'all pray for my uh, my voice as we go through this. I don't know what's what's going on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, knowing how blessed we are just to be able to come and to lift up petitions and prayers, and, and know that you hear and answer prayers. And Lord, we've been praying this week for our mission team that's down in Mexico. We look forward to hearing of the fruit that you've brought forth through them as a result of this trip. And, and Lord, we just pray that you'll get them home safely, allow them to get the rest that they need on Saturday, but hit the ground Sunday morning just full of, of what you've done through them this week. Lord, we pray for those house churches that they're leaving behind. Our pastor said last week there was a an, uh, an opportunity for them to double in size as a result of the effort this week. And Lord, you say we have not because we ask not, and we're asking you to double these churches. Over these next few days, Lord, help them just be awed by the amount of fruit that, that they see. And then, Lord, as, as, as time marches on, we just look forward to these churches becoming established, the, the leadership of these churches, the house pastors, the church planners, all the, all the ones that need to to follow up down there, Lord. We just pray that you will make yourself known through them. And Brother Keith told us that there was a, maybe thousands of people in a population of 1.2 million. And Lord, we calculated some stuff out. If there's 5,000 born-again Christians in, in, in Nogles Caliente, 5,000 out of 1.2 million is 0.004% of that population. So, Lord, we would ask that you make that 4% of the population, 40% of the population. Lord, we know that you're able to do all things, and we just want to ask you to, to just blow their socks off with just how you're pouring out yourself in revival. Lord, these families that have lost three-year-olds, the Gorman family, the Dancer family, Lord, we lift them up to you. We lift those marriages up to you. We know that marriages struggle when, when children are lost because there's just that friction there. So, Lord, help us as, as fellow Christians be counselors to these folks. Help us to, to love on them. Help us just to, to show your love to them. Help them understand, Lord, what you're doing in these situations, although understanding probably never will come. 
Lord, for Charlie Reedy and Josh McDonald and this drug addiction that they have. Lord, we pray that you'll break that cycle. And the only way to truly do that, Lord, is for them to allow you to work in their lives. Make yourself known to them, Lord. Make yourself just the answer that they're looking for. Charlie checked herself into this Christian rehab, so there is a chance there. But Josh, Lord, is just lost and floundering. We ask you, Lord, to, again, just draw him to you as only you can. We lift up Mary to you, Lord, with this pain that she's having in this foot. If she goes to the doctor tomorrow, Lord, we just pray that you'll allow this foot to be healing the way it needs to be healing and allow for Mary just to continue to get stronger and stronger. And, Lord, we just look forward to, to a, a good report there. Lord, we lift up Kelly Smith and her family to you and just the stress and strain that this kind of diagnosis puts on a family. Lord, the fact that she can't pick up her child, the fact that she's going to have to travel back and forth to Jacksonville for these classes. Lord, she needs an extra dose of who you are and what you do for us. Lord, we just ask you to make yourself known there. For the Jean Dykes family and, and her passing. Lord, for this friend of the Chapman family who was struck in the face with fireworks and now has some reconstructive surgery to do. Lord, we just lift them up to you. Lord, we thank you for the report we got on Sharon tonight. Thank you, Lord, that her PET scan was clear. Thank you, Lord, that she seems to be getting stronger. And Lord, we just want to give you all the praise and glory for what you're doing there. And then, Lord, I ask you to be with Miriam and Gary as they d deal with this diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia and just the, the ravages that it has on, on, your, on your bone marrow, on your blood, you know, not producing the blood the way it should. Lord, if it is possible for her to get in this clinical trial, we just ask you to open those doors wide open and uh, allow them to work and allow them to, to see results through this trial. No matter what happens, Lord, we know you are sovereign Lord. You're, you're the Lord God Almighty. You're the one that heals. You're Jehovah Rapha. And sometimes you choose to heal us through graduation. And Lord, if that be the case in any of these situations, we just pray, Lord, that as a church we will embrace that and be able to continually praise you for who you are and what you've done for us. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. <coughs> what is the longest book in the Bible? Okay, very. Some of y'all must be studying Jeremiah. That came out just like that. Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible, and we're trying to cover it right now in our adult Sunday school classes. We're... Uh, you know, if, if you look at a list, I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I drew up a list. Jeremiah, Genesis, Psalms, Exodus, uh, Ezekiel, Exodus, Isaiah, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Second Chronicles, First Samuel. And uh, so really, if you, you know, I, I, I've been challenging my, my folks to answer that question, Jeremiah, for the last week. But if you consider that when, when First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles were written, it was actually larger, substantially larger, than Jeremiah, Genesis, or any of the others. The issue there is that when they wrote books back then, they put them on scrolls. And they couldn't get a scroll big enough to hold all that when they started adding vowels to the, to the language when they made the Septuagint and that kind of stuff. So as we have our Bible, Jeremiah is definitely the longest. And as we're going through the studies this, this quarter in our, in our Sunday school, you know, we, we have chapters to cover on a weekly basis. And, and we've ended up, of course, uh, the quarterly is designed by people that know what they're doing, and they, they take a little section like, like this week. I think it was, uh, we, we had, two weeks ago we had, chap well, this week we had chapters 18, 19, and 20. And, and they took just a few verses out of chapter 18 and said, okay, this is what we're going to focus on. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had chapters 11 through 17. 
here's a few verses for you to, to look at. But in our class, we usually try to cover as much of it as we can without overloading people. I've found myself in the past trying to, to cover too much information, and people come out with ears bleeding and, and that kind of stuff. So it, it became just impossible to try to, try to uh, cover everything. And as we went through chapters 18 and 19 last week, we got to chapter 20, and I looked up, and it was about 10 minutes to 11. I said, well, we'll just do this chapter 20 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, look with me in chapter 20 of the book of Jeremiah, and let's, let's figure out where we are tonight. <clears throat> For those of you that aren't in our Jeremiah study, and there's, there's got to be some in here that probably aren't, I want us to start with just a, a background of the book of Jeremiah and an understanding that Jeremiah was written in a historical context. It actually happened. And we're given information, if you go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, it gives you Jeremiah's daddy. It, it, of the priests who were at Anatoth, we know where Anatoth was. It was about close to three miles northwest of, of, of Jerusalem, where if you go... Uh, northeast of Jerusalem. If you go northwest of Jerusalem, you hit Bethlehem about the same distance off. It's about that far on those maps that they put in the back of your Bible if you want to look back there. But the idea is you're, you're at Jerusalem, and when Jeremiah walked out his front door in the morning, he could probably look over and see the temple from his house because he was up on a mountain, and he was looking over at a mountain. So the valleys between them, he could probably just look right out there and see what was going on. We know that Anatoth was one of the Levitical priest towns. You know, if you go back into, into Joshua, when they started dividing the land up, they were given the, the Levitical priests, remember, were going to be priests, not farmers or shepherds or whatever. So they gave them strategically located uh, town cities and the sur suburbs around them, so to speak, and that became... The, the homes of the priest. So you had Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came, and we know when this happened. It says, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Josiah, besides being my grandson's name, is the, is the last great king. As a matter of fact, all the way back to David. You can go all the way back to David, and, and you read and and. and 2 Kings, I think around 21, 22, somewhere in there, that Josiah was the best of all the kings all the way back to David. He was 100% committed to the Lord. And it says, the word of the Lord came to Josiah, the son of Ammon, king, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. So if you go back in time, we're talking about the year 627. 627 was a big year in the ancient, Eastern, <laughs> ancient Near East. 627 also happened to coincide with the year that this Yahoo named Assurbanipal II died. And Assurbanipal II was the last great king of the Assyrians. So what this is telling us is at 627, when Josiah was about as strong as he was going to get, or shortly thereafter, because what happens in Assyria, who was like the dominant power for like centuries. You know, they had been on the scene for a long time, but they had this, the, like a sine wave. They would go up and down and up and down. And during Ashurbanipal, they were the first great world power. Mean bunch of people. Brutal bunch of people. And, and what they would do is go be as bad as they could possibly be to scare everybody in the neighborhood into giving them money so they wouldn't have to come fight. Mean, mean people. So what ends up happening in 627, you have Ashurbanipal die, and then... There's these civil wars that happen within Assyria. There's an internal strife that's going on. And, and what happens is Assyria starts falling further and further. And this Yehu by the name of Nabopolassar, 
that happens to be Nebuchadnezzar's daddy, Nebuchadnezzar ends up fighting against the remnants of Assyria. Assyria still got quite an army, and they're well-trained and all that kind of stuff. And it took them from like 626 to 609. Let me see. I got that written down here. To 612 until the combined armies of the Medes and the Babylonians were finally able to defeat the Assyrians in a place called Nineveh. For those of you that have some kind of biblical background, Nineveh was this great city. And, and the, the armies of the, of the Medes and the Babylonians were able just to, to go in and defeat them. First time the Assyrians had been beaten. And then what ends up happening is Egypt decides that it's time for them. They see the ascendancy of Babylon, and they determine it's time for us. We better, either, we better bow up or we're going to be overtaken by Babylon too. So what they do is make an alliance with the Assyrians that are left over, the, the remnants of the Assyrian army and whatnot. And they come walking out of Egypt, marching out of Egypt, and Josiah says, no, we're not going to let you do that. He goes out and gets killed. So in 609, the greatest king that ever lived is wiped off Israel's map, basically. And from that point on, you have things going downhill. You have Josiah killed at Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will eventually be fought, by Pharaoh Necho. And Necho took one of, his, one of Josiah's boys named Jehoahaz and puts him on the throne. He only lasts for three months. They don't have telephones back then. They had to wait for a while until Pharaoh came back in and said, no, I don't want Jehoahaz there. I want Jehoiakim there. So he puts his man on the throne. So Jehoiakim becomes the leader. And if you, if you look at verse 3 in the first chapter, it says, It came also in the days of Jehoiakim. You had Josiah there when, when, uh, when uh, Jeremiah starts. And then you have Jehoiakim, and then you have Zedekiah. Well, between Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, Babylon does take over. You know, in 605, they end up beating the... Uh, let me see, I got that written down here somewhere. 605, Nebuchadnezzar defeats Egypt and the remnants of the Assyrian army at Carchemish. And Jehoiachin, not Kim, but Chin rules for uh, uh, three months, and he's replaced by Zedekiah. So you've got all this stuff going on. I say this to help you understand this is history. This is stuff that really happened. You don't have to just go back to biblical sources to know that this stuff was really happening. And God wants us to know that he is the God of history. And all this stuff that we're learning about here in the book of Jeremiah is, is stuff that we need to, to understand. This is not just some cool story. This is world history and, and the way God chose to work in this situation. <clears throat> so if we go... If we go to chapter 20, wish I had Calvin here tonight to read for me. <coughs> Excuse me. When Pasher, the priest of the son of Emmer, who was chief officer of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Okay, so we're, we're jumping in the middle of something here that we really, if, it's, if this is your first time hearing this, you probably don't know what's going on. But what's going on is this. Jeremiah is called. And, and you go back to chapter 1, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mama's womb. And I'm going to make you like a, an iron pillar. I'm going to make you like a bronze wall. I'm going to make you like a fortified city. You're going to have to stand. But oh, by the way, you're going to stand alone. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's going to like you. And you have chapters 1 through 1 to call, and, and, and you have God saying, Jeremiah, here's something I want you to say. And Jeremiah, go out and say it. But when you get to chapter 11, and all the way up through where we are tonight in chapter 20, what you're dealing with here is called Jeremiah's confessions, Jeremiah's protest, Jeremiah's laments. And there's like six times 
where we see the personality of Jeremiah coming out. And we're going to get to it when we get down into verse 7 of this chapter. But the bottom line here is you've got Jeremiah who over the course of chapters 11 through 19 has had five instances where he's saying, time out, Lord. <laughs> time out. And we don't have time tonight to go through. I would love to. We don't have time on Sunday morning to go through it either. But the bottom line is those protests are are something we should understand. They're laments. They're, jo they're, they're taking Jeremiah at his lowest. And, and when he's down, his, his, his thought process is to be totally honest with the Lord. He tells God exactly what he's thinking. Chapters 18, 19, and 20 were, were, were a subsection in our Sunday school quarter last week. Chapter 18, he, he sends Jeremiah to the potter's house, and he throws the clay on the potter's wheel. And he's working this thing out, and all of a sudden it throws a wobble, and he just slams it down and starts over. And basically, let's go to chapter 18, verse 7. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to uproot. If you go back into chapter 1, Jeremiah was given four things that he could do to destroy a nation and two things he could do to build them up. You can pluck up, you can uproot, or you can build up. There's, we don't have time to go back and, and teach all that, but the bottom line is he's, he's given twice as much teardown information as he is build up information. But right here in chapter 18, God is given one last shot at it. He says, Israel, you're like this, this clump of clay. And I, I was going to make an object of you, and, and it didn't work out. But here in verse 7, it says, At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation, if that nation, which I've spoken, turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity, I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or plant. And if it does evil in my sight, not obey my voice, then I will think better the good with which I had promised to bless it. And, and the bottom line here is he's saying, look, it's up to y'all. You can either obey. I'm going all the way back to Deuteronomy. If you obey me, I will bless you just unmeasurably but if you disobey me <laughs> he told Manasseh when Manasseh built those Asherah poles inside the temple when he built that bell worship inside the temple he says I'm going to take Jerusalem and wipe it like a dirty plate that's and that's where he made up his mind that Israel was good. but he still in situations like this in chapter 18 he says you still got an opportunity you, I, I'm willing, if you'll just trust me, if you'll turn back to me, I'll change my mind. Look at verse 11 of chapter 18. So now then speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I, Behold, I'm fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan. I, I, I'm telling y'all, I'm planning to destroy you. Calamity's coming. Oh, turn back each of you from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. And what did they say? <laughs> Look at verse 12. But they will say, it's hopeless. For we are going to follow our own plans. You see, these people thought they had God in a box. They had the temple. They did their worship services every Sunday. They came on Wednesday night if it's necessary. They were doing things for God, but they were also worshiping Baal and worshiping Asherah. And, and if you go back into that Deuteronomy passage in chapter 27, 28, where, where Moses said, when y'all get into the land, Joshua, I want you to take these people to Mount Gerizim. 
and Mount Ebal. There's a little valley right there between the two of them. And I want you to put half the tribes up on Mount Gerizim and half the tribes up on Mount Ebal. And I want you to say, if you obey, I will bless you. And if you, cur- if you disobey, I will curse you. And the very first curse, you've got, you've got chapters of curses that are coming. And the very first one says, if you worship idols, <laughs> we're done. I, I will not, the very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Look at those first four commandments. He was saying, y'all need to focus on me. But they were interested in their sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They wanted to be prosperous. We, we look at them and we throw rocks and say, how could they possibly whittle out this idol and think it was going to do something for them? We've got the same idols. We just don't put the little figure in front of them. Our idols are still the same. If you go over into chapter 19, there's another pottery type example. Jeremiah has told a couple of times, we're going to put on a show. We're going to do something to get their attention. Go look at the, the potter on the, with the clay. Now I want you to go get a pot from, from a potter and take it out to the valley of the son of Hinnon. And what that valley is in the New Testament is called Gehenna. And what that valley is is a picture of hell. And what Jeremiah tells you a couple of different times now is this is where the Lord is going to kill just thousands of people. And he's going, you're going to start burying people in, in the valley of, of the son of Hinnon. But there's not going to be enough people to dig graves. You're going to run out of grave room. You're going to end up, people are going to die, and we're just going to leave them laying as dung on the ground, and the buzzards are going to get fat. And it's a picture of hell. And Jesus said of this same place, don't be worried about the one who can kill your body. Worry about the one who can kill your soul and send you to hell, send you to the valley of the son of Hinnon. That's what chapter 19 is about. And he takes this, this pot and, and he breaks it. Now, we're not talking about throwing it down where the handle breaks off of it and you can still use it. He breaks this pot in, in, a, in a place where... Basically, Gehenna was the trash dump where they burned the trash. And the stuff that wouldn't burn because it had been fired in a kiln, they piled it up in this, in this area outside the gate. And he took this pot out there to that area of all that trash that wouldn't burn. And he took it and he shattered it. We were at the house a couple of weeks back and, and Ann and I are... When we get to cooking in the kitchen together, all kind of things can happen. Well, she had turned the burner on. I didn't know about it. And I took a plate and sat it on the burner. And we have got busy doing other stuff. And she didn't know I put the plate on there. And I didn't know she had turned it on. And all of a sudden, this plate explodes. I'm talking about explodes. This has been about a month ago. Yesterday, I found a piece of shattered glass off this thing in the back of one of the cabinets up there where you don't move all the stuff all the time. Looked up there and dad blind. There was no way this plate could be put back together. It was in thousands of little bitty, itty bitty fragments of a plate. It took a while to clean it up, and we're still finding <laughs> little pieces of glass here and there. That's the kind of break that's mentioned here. This same word for break that's used here in chapter 19 is the same break for when, when God uses hailstones to shatter the forest in Joshua's time when he's fighting the wars. It's the same type of break that that says shattered the forest over there. We got, we got 20 minutes left. So we better get back into chapter 20. Let's go with chapter 20. To get to chapter 20 right here in these first six verses, you have to back up to, chap- to, chap- to, to verse 14 of the previous chapter. So what ended up happening there to bring you from the early parts of chapter 19 to verse 14 is, is Josiah had gone out to Topeth, which was the place where they burned children. 
in the valley. High places don't have to be up on mountains. This high place was in a valley where they just built this, this altar up with this fire. And people didn't walk outside and say, well, it'd be a good day to burn my baby. No, they were told, this is how you get in Baal's favor. This is how you get in Asher's favor. And you had all these prophets and priests that the people expected to tell them the truth these people were leading them to burn their children at Topeth. So in verse 14 it says, Then Jeremiah came from Topeth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And his prophecy there was like, we talked in chapter 18 about you still got a chance. Chapter 19 says your ch it's too late. Your chance is over. It, you will not be saved because you're stiff-necked. Matter of fact, we're going to get there in just a minute. Then Jeremiah came in verse 14 of, of chapter 19, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house. He's at the temple. And he said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to bring on this city and all its towns and the entire calamity that I've declared against it, because they have stiffened their necks. So as not to heed my words. You stiff-necked people. You're not listening. I've warned you all the way back from before you became a nation. I've been warning you about what's going to happen. And you have finally, when Manasseh built those altars inside my temple, the place that when Solomon dedicated it, my presence was such a, a cloud, a presence there, that the, the people that were trying to sing couldn't do it. They, everybody was on their faces on the ground because the presence of the Lord had shown up. And these people believed that they had that God still on their side no matter what they did. So here in verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1, when Pasher, and by the way, his name means Fruitful on every side. That will become important here in a few minutes. Pastured the priest, the son of Emmer, who was the chief officer of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, and Pastor had Jeremiah the prophet beaten. This is the first time. If you go back and read these protests, the people in Anatoth, Lord, are trying to kill me. My friends, my neighbors, my family is trying to kill me. Lord, help me. That's the first of his protest. And we've worked our way up here into chapter 20 where you've got Pasher, and Pasher takes him and literally beats him. But then he says, and put him in stocks. Now, we're not talking about like what the Puritans used to do when you put somebody's head and everybody makes fun of them. This was one of those devices where you strap them up with the arms as high as they could be and the feet as tight as they could be, and you start twisting them. It's a torture chamber. That's what these stocks are. And Jeremiah is going through this torture. And Lord God, you called me to this? Lord, I don't understand. So Pastor had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him in stocks that, that were in the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. And on the next day, Pastor said, well, we better turn him loose. So when Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said, If Pasher is not the name that the Lord has called you, but rather Magor Misabib. Magor Misabib. And what that means, if you've got a New American Standard Bible down in the bottom, it says where the one goes. It says terror on all sides. So Pasher, your name was fruitful on all sides. And now... Is going to be terror on all sides. For thus says the Lord in verse 4, Because I'm going to make you a terror to yourself and to all of your friends, and while your eyes look on, they will fall by the sword of their enemies. So I will give over all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon. This is the first time Babylon is mentioned by name. You've had the, the, the armies coming in from the north, but this is the first time that, that, that uh, Jeremiah has, has said, this is who's coming. And remember, they know what's happening in the world. China and Russia are 
are showing up. You know, that's the kind of thing that's going on in the world. You got Assyria that's been beaten. You've got Egypt who they trust. You know, if you if if they have their choice of Egypt or 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 Babylon, Lord, give us Egypt. At least we've been there before. We we, we know how to get it's close. You know, <laughs> don't let these Babylonians come. <laughs> but here, here Jeremiah says, So I will give you over all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will carry them away as exiles in Babylon, and will slay them with the sword. And I will give over all the wealth of this city, and all its produce, and all its costly things, everything that you thought you were, you were striving for, <laughs> it's lost. It's all going to them. Even all the treasures of the kings of Judah I will give over to their hand of their enemies, and they will plunder them, take them away, and bring them to Babylon. There's going to be an exile that's coming. And you, Pasher, and all who live in your house will go into captivity, and you will enter Babylon, and there you will die. And there you will be buried, and you and all your friends to whom you have falsely prophesied. So that's kind of like the end of chapters 18, 19, and, and 20's narrative. But now we're going to get into the, to the confession, to the lament, to the, to the complaint that Jeremiah has. Before we do that, I want to, I want to step back. Brother Keith has said a number, number of times, you're either heading into a crisis you're in a crisis, or you're coming out of a crisis. That's, there's a, there's a, a circular type thing that goes on. You're, you're either up there just oblivious, everything's going my way, got plenty of money, good health, er, something happens. And Walter Brueggemann was a, a famous pastor, historian, theologian, and he, he, he said there's a, there's a, a, a cycle, cyclical thing like this where you're oriented, you're disoriented, and then you're reoriented. So when you're oriented, everything is going the way you expect, but then you get disoriented. Things aren't working the way you expect. And then you, you work your way through that and you become reoriented, but you don't become reoriented back to the same place you were. You get back to, you're reoriented to somewhere close and then you come back and, and you have a new normal. And then the cycle goes again. At this point in time, if we get to verse 7, we look at, at Jeremiah and, and, and listen. <laughs> I wish we had time to go back into these previous five protests, previous five confessions previous five laments and, 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 and read some of the things that Jeremiah has said about the Lord. But this is, a, this is the longest of those laments. This is the closing of those confessions. This, this chapter right here, it, it gives us his, his lament. It says, O oh Lord, you've deceived me and I've, de and I've deceived you. You have overcome me and prevailed. Lord, I'm a laughing stock. <laughs> Lord, I thought I was signing up for your team, and we're the bit you and you and you know, me and Jesus is enough. <laughs> That's not what Jeremiah's saying here. Lord, I didn't sign up for this. Lord, I thought we were going to be the winners. I've been talking to these people for 15, 20 years, and all the stuff that I've been telling them, they're ignoring. Verse 8, for each time I speak, I cry aloud and proclaim violence and destruction because for, for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. Lord, we know Jeremiah has the nickname the weeping prophet, and if you go back over into chapter like 15, 16, somewhere in there, it talks about how my eyes flow with tears because I see what's going to happen. 
<laughs> and I'm just, I'm just devastated with it. Here he's saying, Lord, I've been telling these people about what you're going to do. And they don't believe me anymore, Lord. They don't. It hasn't happened. Lord, I'm ready to quit. That's what it says in verse 9. But if I say I will not remember him, or I won't speak anymore in his name, then my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in, and I cannot, and I've got to share. The Lord's not letting me quit. That's what he's saying here. Man, I want to quit. I'm tired of being the laughing stock. I, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. Look at verse 10. For I have heard the whispering of many, terror on every side, this is what they're saying behind his back. Terror on every side. If you go back over into chapter 6, verse 25, I'll look there real quick. We see this terror on every side for the first time. 625, that's 525. 625 says. 25. Do not go out into the field and do not walk on the road. And he's talking about where the the, the armies from the north are coming in. Do not go out into the field. Do not walk on the road for the enemy has a sword terror on every side. We're way back in chapter 6. And this terror is coming. Terror is coming. Terror is coming. Pasher, your name's no longer fruitful on every side. Now your name is terror on every side. And they're mocking him. Terror on every side. Yeah, right. This fool. Let's kill him. Terror on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall say, perhaps we'll be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. This is the only guy that's messing up our good time. If, if, if we could just shut him up, we would be all nines. You know, it would, it would just be perfect for us. But here he is. But Lord, so you've got a little switch happening here. And I wish we had time to go back. My intent was going to Psalm 13 and show you what a lament psalm is like and, and try to lay that down on top of what Jeremiah is doing here. But the Lord, in verse 11, but the Lord is with me like a dread champion, like a terror, like, <laughs> like the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed. With an everlasting grace, they will not be forgotten. Yet, O oh Lord of hosts, O oh Lord God Almighty, the Lord of the army of hosts, the angel armies, one angel wiped out 185,000 Assyrians, and here this, I'm talking about the Lord of hosts, that dread champion from back up there in verse 11. Yet, O oh Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. Lord, Lord, turn it on. I'm ready to watch. The, because of the way they're treating me, I'm ready for you to turn your wrath loose on them. For to you I have set my cause. If you look back at a lament, if I can find what I wrote down, it would be helpful. A lament psalm. If you go back into chapter 13, you have an address. I'm talking about Psalm 13. You have an address. You have a complaint. You have a petition. You have an expression of trust. And then you have the vow. And that's kind of what we've been through here. The problem is <laughs> it doesn't stop here. You know, for, for a true lament... The idea is you express to the Lord what your, what your issue is. And I want you to notice something back here. Go back up to verse 7. Lord, you have deceived me. 
first person pronoun. You've deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughing stock. Everyone mocks me. When you read these songs of lament throughout the Bible, when you have these personal pronouns, put your name in those, in those places. When things don't go our way, this is where we go to get how to express ourselves before the Lord. Verse 13 says, sing to the Lord. This is that praise, that, that vow of praise. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one. This is one of those future perfect tenses. It's like you're looking back and seeing what the Lord has done and using that as you write it down. You know, it's, it's as though it is done. The Bible's famous for some of that kind of stuff. You know, the Lord has promised us, and we can depend on that as though it has already been done, though we can't see it. And that's the situation that Jeremiah is talking about here. For he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the, from the hand of the evil. Lord, Lord I know you're going to do it. It would be wonderful if it stopped there. We don't get relief like that all the time. Listen to what he says in verse 14. Cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother born. Lord, I wish I had never been born. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father saying, a baby boy has been born to you and made him very happy. But let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting and let him hear an outcry in the morning and a shout of alarm at noon because he did not kill me before birth. Lord, I wish he had not only killed me. I wish he had killed my mama so I'd never been born and I would be eternally in her womb ever pregnant. Why did I ever come forth from the womb? To look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? That's not what we expect. We expect everybody to stop at, at verse 13. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he's delivered the soul. He's delivered the soul. I'm the needy one and he's delivered me. Thank you, Lord. Curse the day I was born. I wish my mom had died before I got born so I'd be, she'd be eternally pregnant and I wouldn't have to worry about all this mess. Sometimes we don't get good news. Sometimes it ain't going to work out the way we think it should work. But we got to understand we're in chapter 20. Things are going to work out. Not in our timing, but in God's timing. Look at the very last of the book. Go, go all the way, whatever chapter ends the book of Jeremiah. Remember I talked about there were some, there were some kings. If you go to Lamentations, you've gone too far. We're at the very last of the book. We're in, we're in Babylon. Evil Merodach is the king. Nebuchadnezzar's dead and gone. Evil Merodach is king. Remember I told you that all this stuff was happening with all these battles going on in Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and all this kind of stuff? And, and, and uh, Jehoiakim is, is, is replaced by Jehoiachin, and he's on the throne for like three months. And Babylon comes in and takes him to Babylon. He's exile. He's in that 597 exile that Ezekiel, the pastor's teaching us on Wednesday night. He's in that exile where he goes to Babylon. The end of the book. Verse 31. Now it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim. So you go to seven, uh, 597 and, and 30, 37 years. You're, you're in, the, in the 560s time frame in there. 
this is still history. This is still stuff that really happened. Now, it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, who we really hadn't heard much about because he was only on the scene for like three months. King of Judah in the 12th month, the 25th of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, showed favor to Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he, then he spoke kindly to him and set his throne Nebuchadnezzar had a, a, a collection of kings. If you go back and read the history of what's going on here, all these places that he conquered, he didn't just kill everybody. He would bring the kings home to lord himself over them. So he had this collection of kings. And verse 31 there says, In the first year of the reign, showed favor to Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of the prison. And then he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the thrones of the kings who were in Babylon. He, he sets Jehoiachin up as the king of the kings in his king collection. So Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life for his allowance and regular allowance was for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king of Babylon, a daily portion all the days of his life until he died, until his death. So you got all this stuff going on. God has still gotten these. Jehoiachin has kids in Babylon. One of them named the Shealtiel. He'll become important when you get there, there you go. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. I didn't know that. But when you get into Ezra, when you get into to some of these other minor prophets, when you get into Nebuchad uh, Nehemiah, Shealtiel <laughs> is a big deal. We're over. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to make your word personal. You know, when Jeremiah said, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, it's okay for us to be able to tell you that. Lord, we need to learn some things. Our suffering can be taken to you in prayer, Lord. We're going to suffer. Your word tells us that. And Lord, when we suffer, help us to understand it's okay. It's expected for us to take our suffering to you. Lord, sometimes we suffer for you because of, that's what was happening to Jeremiah. He was suffering because of you, Lord. It's okay for us to blame you for our problems. Jeremiah did. Another thing we learn out of this, Lord, is, is you're always, always, always to be praised, even in the midst of our suffering. And Lord, sometimes, sometimes suffering, even though we've, we've done all that stuff, even though we've, we've, we've praised you, Lord, the suffering lasts. It puts a question mark over our, our very existence. But Lord, it never has the last word. Lord, there's people in this room tonight that are suffering. A lot of us have what we like to call unspoken prayer requests. Lord, you know them. Help us to feel honest with you. Help us to be able to be honest with you. Jeremiah surely was in these chapters 11 through 20. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, Lord, he came to you with his complaints. He came to you with his petitions. He came to you with his need. Lord, that's what you expect from us. 
Lord, we want to sing your praise. No matter the storm, no matter the test result, no matter the expectation that's unfulfilled, no matter the disappointment, Lord, help us to be known as yours. Help us to be willing to suffer for you. Help us to be willing to praise you in our suffering. We're going to give you all the praise and glory for what you accomplish. And Lord, be with our, our mission team. Help them finish strong. Give them rest when they need it. Lord, but give them your strength. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.